for those who might have RSVP but couldn't join us today, um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel a little bit later. We encourage you to use the chat box at any time. I'll be monitoring that for questions or comments for our speaker. Um, and uh, we'll get started after a couple of uh, quick announcements. If, um, if you're not familiar with TASA or this is the first time you've ever joined us for one of our webinars, welcome. Um, I'm your host, that's me, Christina Coltis. I'm your TASA training director. If you need anything um, from TASA about this webinar or documentation of this webinar, please get in touch with me at that email address. Um, but we are your statewide advocacy organization here in Texas working to address and eliminate sexual violence. And of course, we do that through our work um, during uh, for public policy, training, prevention. Essentially, we want to be in space with you to help you um, provide the best possible support to sexual assault survivors um, and strategies for um, intervention and prevention. So if you're not familiar with us, get, get in touch. We would love to support your work. Um, we have a, an amazing statewide conference coming up in Houston. We're very excited. Um, if you've not already registered for the conference, you really should consider it. Um, you can check out more information at tasaconference.org. Um, but we're looking forward to being in Houston, and, and we'll, we really hope that you'll join us. Um, webinars, normally I announce some future webinars. Right now, we are changing platforms from GoToTraining, which is what we're currently on, to Zoom. Um, and so in that transition, we don't have anything currently scheduled. Um, but stay on the lookout. You're probably on our email list, and we will announce future webinars once that transition is complete. Um, again, like I said earlier, um, you can check out past webinars on our YouTube channel um, right here, and I'll post it in the chat box as well. So without further ado, we're going to do a little transition to our speaker. I'm going to change the presenter screen, and we'll, we'll get her... Um, get her started. We're very excited to have Jessica with us today to share um, her work that she does at Trala. Jessica, are you there? I am. Hello. Hello. All right. I am shifting the presenter screen to you so you can have a pop up in a moment. Great. All right, great. Do you see it? I do. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. And don't forget to use the chat box for any questions or comments during today's presentation. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. In the next hour, I'll be telling you a little bit about some legal resources for agencies serving survivors of sexual violence. Of course, it wouldn't be a legal presentation if I didn't start with a little disclaimer that nothing in this presentation should be construed as legal advice. I'll do my best to answer general questions and I encourage you to put them in the chat box. I think questions make these kinds of presentations a little more interesting. Uh, but any questions that delve into specific legal advice, I likely will not be able to answer today. But my contact information is in this presentation, so you are absolutely encouraged to reach out to me after this presentation if you have specific legal questions. So don't hesitate to reach out. All right, so I want to start with who's in the room. So if you all will write the agency that you work for and your title in the chat box, you're also very welcome to write a little blurb about the work your agency does if you so choose. Uh, we have an intimate group here, I believe. Let's see, of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of us. So feel free to put your information in the chat box. Okay, so a little bit about me while y'all are typing that out. My name's Jessica, that's my face. <laughs> I'm an attorney at Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. And before I was working at TRALA, which is the, the acronym that we often use, 
Trala, T-R-L-A. I was an attorney at Safe Alliance, which is our local Travis County domestic violence agency. At Trala, I'm on our LASA team. And if you don't know what LASA means, I will talk about that very briefly in just a minute here. And when I first started, I was primarily practicing family law and privacy law. And now I work with nonprofits that serve survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence. My particular area of expertise is in privacy law and subpoena response. And when I was at SAFE, I was doing some immigration, some family law, and also I was specifically helping um, survivors with class C related issues. So now that I see folks chiming in with their organizations. So it's looking like we're having a lot of dual agencies that are serving both survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. Great. Yeah, keep those coming. I'm just interested to know who is in the room. It looks like we have some pretty diverse individuals. So again, if you have any questions as I'm going through this presentation, please feel free to send them into the chat box and I'll do my best to respond and multitask as I can. So legal aid service areas, I wanna start here. So I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with the various legal aid organizations in Texas. So if you know, please type in the chat box which agency is, which service area your agency is in. And if you are tuning in from out of state, you can just write out of state, but it is important to know for both referral purposes, as you have survivors who have legal needs that your agency can't provide them, legal aid is a good place to start, but this will also be relevant later regarding the, the legal resources available available specific to your agency. All right, looks like we have a mix of folks from different service areas. All right, so I mentioned LASA. So when we talk about legal assistance for survivors of sexual assault, we generally think of the direct services that various agencies can provide to survivors. So this has been a larger topic of conversation in recent years due to the LASA grant, which stands for Legal Aid for Survivors of Sexual Assault. Hopefully you are all aware of this pot of money and it comes from a Texas law taxing sexually oriented businesses. So like think strip clubs, um, some of it, or some people refer to it as the poll tax, but this money has been provided to the above listed agencies here on this slide to serve survivors of sexual assault with their civil legal needs. So when we talk about civil legal needs and civil legal remedies, these are the kind of topics that we generally discuss. So when we think about safety, we think about things like protective orders in addition to safety planning generally. Uh, when we talk about privacy, we may think of ensuring access to pseudonyms in criminal cases or subpoena response when a survivor's records are requested. When we think of employment, that could be a person experiencing sexual assault in the workplace or somebody whose ability to maintain a job is affected by their status as a survivor or one that's kind of lesser thought of is a person whose ability to maintain a job is affected by the duties of taking care of a, fem a family member that has been assaulted. Think of a parent taking care of a child, dealing with potentially the CPS system, dealing with counseling appointments, CAC interviews, that sort of thing. When we talk about housing, it could be a person terminating their lease early because they were assaulted in their home or elsewhere on the premises of their apartment complex. When we talk about education, 
It could be advocating for a K through 12 or higher ed student who has been assaulted by another student or a staff member or asking for accommodations for a student affected by sexual assault. Financial or consumer issues could be identity theft or coerced debt issues. And when we think of immigration, we know that there are immigration remedies for victims of crime and survivors of trafficking. With family law, which I think is often the most common, we think of divorces, custody, also protective orders, as I already mentioned. And so at Trala, we also have teams that work to help specific populations and tend to their needs, which are often intersecting with their needs as survivors of sexual assault, such as veterans, LGBTQ folks, and our foster youth team. Now, I'm imagining that nothing I'm saying to you right now is news to you. And if you have any questions about any of these things, we're not going to discuss them further today, but please feel free to reach out to me. I can always point you in the right direction. So my organization is funded to provide legal services in areas such as the topics I just mentioned. However, there are some exceptions. So some of our programs extend beyond our normal service area. So for example, our foster youth team is statewide and we have a farm worker team that's able to help people beyond Texas. And surprise, surprise, nonprofits. So Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid can help nonprofits statewide. So our program that helps nonprofits statewide is called CBAR. So we can help with non-litigation legal assistance. And so that means we help the nonprofit entity itself. Non-litigation means that if your organization is being sued for something, we can't help with that. But we can help with the kinds of things that may decrease the likelihood that your organization might face litigation. So for those nonprofits located within our service area, which again is that kind of tan goldish service area in the southwest of Texas, nonprofits located within our service area, we can provide assistance through pro bono attorneys and directly through our TRALA attorneys, depending on the type and complexity of the case. And I'm going to get a little bit more into all of these various things that we can help with. Um, but because of the diverse areas of law, sometimes certain matters are better suited in-house versus other matters are better suited for pro bono attorneys. So for organizations that are outside of our service area, we can primarily provide assistance by matching you to pro bono attorneys. Now these pro bono attorneys are not limited by geographic area. Since most transactional legal assistance can be handled online or over the phone. These attorneys generally come from big firms who are looking to help nonprofits do good work. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we have over 150 pro bono attorneys looking to help. So this is just a screenshot of our website, which Christina has also put in the chat box if you want to go look at it. And the application can be found there. Um, the application can either, there's a billable PDF, you can also print it out and handwrite it if you prefer. And you can email it to texascbar at trala.org. You can also call with questions. And as I said, my contact information is in this presentation and again at the end, and you're very welcome to reach out to me. So who qualifies? So first and foremost, every organization must directly assist low-income Texans. So when I say directly, I'm talking about that they provide the services directly to the survivors. So generally speaking, foundations don't qualify because generally foundations um, and also coalitions where they serve the agencies that serve survivors. 
So we are able to help agencies that directly serve survivors. Sometimes foundations can qualify if they, as part of their work, they do provide direct services to survivors. So it just, it depends. So I also specifically said low income Texans because we generally can't assist folks with international missions that provide services abroad. So the organization also has to have a principal activity to serve low income individuals. Now this doesn't mean that they must only serve low income. There just has to be an argument that they do serve low income folks and do so purposefully. Generally, again, organizations that provide services to survivors will qualify because we know how being a survivor can affect a person's um, income and ability to support themselves. So the organization must not have the means to hire an attorney. And so there's no income guideline currently that says if your organization has a certain amount of money, they don't qualify. Um, there's nothing like that. And generally, if most of an organization's funds are going back into their programming, they will qualify. So then Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid is subject to certain um, LSC guidelines. LSC being the Legal Services Corporation, um, one of the main funders of our work. And they have guidelines that dictate who we can help uh, immigration status wise. Luckily, we can serve anyone who has experienced cruelty or parents of children who have also experienced cruelty. So again, organizations that serve survivors will generally qualify. So as I said, there's an application on the website. Um, it asks for a lot of different information about the board members, whether they're related, what kind of assistance you're asking for, um, your bylaws, things like that, as well as financial information like a Form 990. But all information is kept confidential and the documents requested are simply used to ensure that the organization qualifies for our services. If anybody have any questions about that, please type it in the chat box. So based on when you all were talking about what organization um, you were from, it didn't seem like I had um, any governmental or universities, although I know I did have a few that signed up. But I do want to at least say, um, if after hearing about our services, you're thinking that your organization doesn't qualify, not to worry. We're next going to be discussing the kinds of things an attorney can help with to help you think of things that you might want to reach out to other counsel to ask about. So if you don't qualify for our services, and to note generally schools don't qualify because they generally have the funds to afford attorneys, but again, when in doubt, it's a good idea to apply especially because sometimes even if a, an organization doesn't qualify for our services, we are still able to um, provide a referral in some cases. So again, when in doubt, go ahead and apply. Um, but so if you don't qualify for our services, it's important to figure out what resources are available to your agency. Do you have in-house counsel? Do you know if you have an in-house counsel? Maybe you have it and you're just not aware of it. Uh, you should find out. And if you do, you should schedule a time to get to know them and ask about the kinds of things that they can assist with. Because it's important to make the connection before you have a hair on fire issue. If your agency doesn't have in-house counsel, you might have attorneys on your board that could help. But it's important to note that doctors, excuse me, lawyers are a lot like doctors. You can ask a dermatologist about a concussion, but they might not be able to help with your targeted issues. Similarly speaking, if most of your board members are um, family attorneys or real estate attorneys, they might not be able to help with all of the issues that your organization faces, but it's worth at least having that conversation. Um, also, you know, attorneys on boards and their willingness to help with legal issues affecting the day-to-day -day running of your organization might also depend on how involved your board is. 
So if you don't have in-house counsel, you may want to seek out local counsel that might be willing to help pro bono for a certain amount of hours or low bono for a reduced fee. And again, having these conversations before you run into issues so you know who you can call if you run into something is a good idea. Some attorneys are very willing to volunteer for causes they believe in and can volunteer their expertise to your agency. So for the next portion, I'm gonna talk about the types of things that an attorney can help your agency with which can be broken down generally into five categories, which are document review, legal consults, trainings, governance or compliance, and other. These are generally things that we can help nonprofits with through CBAR, but also, again, generally things that an attorney may be able to help your agency with. So I'm gonna start with document review. So one thing that's good to discuss with an attorney is your agency's various policies. It's important to periodically update your policies to make sure they reflect the status quo, meaning that those policies are actually being followed by your staff and volunteers. If they're not being followed, there's either a training issue or the policy itself does not fit the purpose it's supposed to serve. So it's good to take a big picture look at the policies to ask the goals of a specific policy, how it's supposed to meet that goal, and whether it's actually meeting that goal. And also, with ever-evolving technology, outdating, outdated policies struggle to encompass current reality. So it's important to stay current. So it's my understanding also that TASA does have some sample policies that members can access um, to, and can use those policies as a model or a jumping off point. So on this slide, we have some examples of the types of policies that you might want an attorney to review. So for example, disaster and emergency planning. So as far as disaster planning, if you're an organization that provides forensic exams, what happens when there's a loss of power? What happens to refrigerated evidence? Is there a generator? Do you have a place to transfer the evidence, keeping in mind chain of custody? If there's a natural disaster, what happens to your documents, both physical and digital? Are your files being backed up? Also, what about other emergencies? If there's a bomb threat or an intruder on the premises, do you have policies to deal with these things if they were to happen? And is the staff periodically trained on these policies? These are important things to think about. So subpoena response is another one that we receive a lot of questions about. A good subpoena protocol requires both internal coordination, meaning your staff is trained on what to do if a subpoena is received by fax or by mail or if a constable or sheriff shows up to the front desk. And if or excuse me, so as far as external coordination, it's important also to educate others in the community that might be sending subpoenas about what is the proper way to send them to you. And so if you're a dual agency that helps survivors of domestic and sexual violence, these protocols can be a little bit tricky as they have to be responsive to the different laws covering sexual assault and domestic violence survivors. Um, so we do many trainings just on privacy and privilege and confidentiality. So of course we have chapter 93 of the Texas Family Code that provides a privilege for adult survivors of domestic violence as well as uh, people in their household who have witnessed the violence. And then we have chapter 420 of the Texas Government Code that covers uh, confidentiality for survivors of sexual assault and also includes important exceptions to that confidentiality. So if that's something that your agency um, hasn't thought through or isn't receiving subpoenas, um, that's definitely something to proactively get started on if that's not something that you have. So firearms on premises, so it's a very important to have a clear policy regarding whether firearms are allowed and if you decide that there 
aren't allowed, there's specific statutory language that you must visibly post outside of your building to let people know that they aren't allowed. Data breach policies have to do with what your agency would do if there's a large scale inadvertent disclosure of information, such as a hacking issue, as well as a smaller scale issue. So meaning that a survivor's information was revealed improperly. It's important to note how you would notify people and what steps would be taken to decrease the likelihood of a breach in the future. Technology policies can be regarding proper use of the agency's technology as well as use of personal technology. So with the widespread use of social media, you may want to implement policies regarding staff not posting pictures of clients or of the inside of your building. And you may even want to think through policies for clients themselves, such as making sure they're not posting uh, social media posts that share your location, especially if you're an organization that has an anonymous location or operates a shelter. Document retention policies have to be dynamic as well. Uh, if you're a dual agency, there are some very um, specific policies that are uh, located in the Texas Administrative Code. And also I will say if you are a dual agency, we do have a legal audit um, for what, what the Texas Admin Code refers to as shelter centers to make sure that folks are complying with all of the many, many uh, regulations that are created by the Texas Admin Code. But anyways, the document retention policies have to be dynamic, as I said. So there are certain types of documents that have to be kept for varying lengths of time depending on what the document is. So for example, there are certain documents that have to be made public for a certain amount of time. So every nonprofit has to make available their Form 990s for the past three years. Many organizations choose to put them on their website. Others just make it such that if somebody requests them, they can send them to that person who requested them. Document retention is governed both by state and federal law. So employee documents should be kept for about four years, depending on the type of document. And then additionally, document retention policies must be accompanied by a destruction schedule. So it's a good idea to mark files with a date of destruction and have staff destroy the records on a regular schedule. Although, of course, if there's an investigation of some kind, you may want to halt the destruction schedule temporarily. So having intentional policies and staff that are trained on these policies protects your agency and your staff. With clear and well-written policies, employees are empowered to make independent decisions and be confident in those decisions. So as far as forms, it's important, again, to make sure that the forms are serving the purpose that they intend. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But I do want to mention, of course, the best practice here is to review your policies annually. If you have policies and manuals that are over five years old, it's a good idea to have them reviewed. And also, it's a really good idea to date all documents so you know when they've last been updated. We generally put an updated date in the bottom right corner of all of our documents with the initials of the person who reviewed it. The good thing about that too is if you have, um, let's say, a statute or a law that goes into effect on a certain date, and then you notice that a form that is somehow affected by that law hasn't been updated since a certain date, that can tip you off to things that need to be updated and when. So, uh, document review. So these are the type of things to keep in mind when reviewing a document creation and retention policy, as well as just generally reviewing forms and documents that clients will fill out. So when your agencies serve survivors of sexual assault, it's important to always keep privacy in mind. And when I say that, I mean it's important with any form or record that agencies keep that the agency thinks through the purpose of the record being kept and what is the most trauma-informed way to retain certain information. 
Survivors should always be informed and empowered to make decisions about their records and about what they disclose. Every time a record is created, the staff member present when the survivor creates the record should be able to explain what will happen to the record in the future so that the survivor can make decisions about what they disclose. So for example, if your agency provides advocates to accompany survivors to forensic exams, if they fill out a sheet or take notes, they should let the survivor know that the file is kept by your agency, that it's not part of their medical exam documents, who will see this document, et cetera. So this of course would be both a policy issue and a training issue. At the same time, we have to always think of both the most likely outcomes and the worst possible outcome, even if it's remote. So it's important to think through instances in which a survivor's documents might be requested. For example, if a survivor discloses a pending lawsuit of any kind, it's important to be wary of what documentation is created and let the survivor know that there's always a chance that their information could be requested. And that if that happened, what your agency would do to notify the survivor and get their permission to release the information. And that it's, the agency has an obligation to take steps to protect the records in most cases. So external document review. So another thing to discuss is uh, documents that are created by your agency or documents that will be signed by other agencies. Um, so kind of either way. Did I hear somebody chiming in by chance? If not, then make sure you all have yourselves muted if you just tuned in, welcome. So this might be an incredibly obvious thing to say, but generally it's a good idea to reach out to an attorney anytime your agency is asked to sign something. So often when we think of contracts, we think of something that we just have to sign. I mean, we all probably sign contracts every day, maybe without realizing it. Anytime you click a button to allow an app to access Facebook or um, click, yes, I agree to these terms, you're signing a contract. And so often we think of something that we just have to sign, but depending on the context, often contracts can be tailored to meet the needs of a signer. So for example, if your organization is operating a confidential hotline, it's important to talk with any phone provider regarding the privacy of the callers and what records are kept regarding who calls and how that information is stored. And it's also important to make sure that those agreements are memorialized in the contract. So also, if you're being asked to do something that you don't think is included in a contract you signed, it's a good idea to reach out to an attorney. So for example, we had an agency that reached out to us because a landlord was saying that they, the agency had to foot the bill to do repairs to the internal HVAC system, not something that they could take with them when they left. So in that case, it was important to look at the lease that they signed to see what provisions were included about what the obligations were of the agency to repair. So it's always a good idea before signing a commercial lease because they can be very complicated to have an attorney review the lease, make sure that you understand all of the provisions so that you understand what your agency is agreeing to. So compliance, what do I mean by compliance? It can mean a lot of different things, but generally speaking, when I say compliance, I'm talking about whether your organization is in compliance with state and federal nonprofit law. Good governance helps your agency stay legal. Now, here at Trollo, we provide entire hour and a half to three hour long trainings on compliance. So I'm not gonna give you the full spiel clearly, since we don't have enough time. And also, admittedly, compliance can be a little bit dry. But just to give you kind of a basic overview, 
Um, unlike businesses, nonprofit corporations are subject to greater federal and state regulatory scrutiny, restrictions, and requirements. And this is because nonprofits deal with other people's money, namely taxpayer money, grant and foundation money, private donations, et cetera. So the IRS recognizes 28 types of 401c nonprofits, all of which are exempt from federal income tax, with C3 being the most common. Um, again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jump terribly deep into this since these things mostly apply to boards, but it's incredibly important for organizations to keep their nonprofit status. So if organizations have compliance questions, this is a good thing to talk about with attorneys. We also get a lot of applications from startups. So if you know an organization that wants to help wants help getting started, that's something we can help with as well. So uh, when we talk about board governance, it's important that the board is essentially not asleep at the wheel and is properly governing the organization. Every board member should comply with the board standards, so acting in good faith with ordinary care in the best interests of the nonprofit. Otherwise, they can face personal liability if they're essentially neglecting their duties. So when we talk about a conflict of interest policy, I'm referring to ensuring that board members aren't personally benefiting from being on the board, and if they are, that that's disclosed. So for example, if a board member owns a building and is wanting to lease that building to the agency, there are certain steps that they have to take. So this is called what's called an interested director transaction. And an interested director transaction can be valid if the material facts are disclosed, so that means the board is aware that this other board member owns this building, and that a majority of the disinterested directors approve in good faith and with ordinary care, or the contract is fair when it's approved. So for instance, in this rental uh, example, are they renting the building at the fair market value? The best practices just briefly for conflicts of interest are, of course, one, having a conflict of interest policy, two, making sure the facts are disclosed, like I just said, um, comparing prices, basically making sure that the, the arrangement is fair. The interested director must abstain from the decision, so the other directors who don't own the property would be the ones that need to make the decision. The action would then need to be approved by a majority of disinterested directors and it should be documented in the minutes of the meeting. And there should also be an annual review of the conflicts of interest policy by each board and staff member so that folks are aware of what they should be doing if there could potentially be an interested, um, an interested director decision. So there is, of course, always compliance as in grant compliance which is something that we can assist with, but there's also always other resources um, for technical assistance. So the grantor of the, the grant itself is often a good place to get some technical assistance. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that TASA can also help with technical assistance for grant compliance as well. Okay, training. So. Policies, of course, as I mentioned, are only as good as the training behind them. So it's important that staff is properly trained on new and existing policies. And so the reason why there's an asterisk on this particular slide is as far as trainings, TRALA and or pro bono attorneys can provide trainings, but in-person trainings may be limited depending on your geographic area. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this one. It's pretty self-explanatory, but um, the common ones, again, are confidentiality, privacy, subpoena protocols, et cetera. And then fundraising, just making sure that your fundraising is compliant, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, civil legal remedies, I always throw that up there because that's a common request, just to make sure that staff is aware of the various civil legal help that survivors can access. Okay, the biggest one that we 
get, I would say, is legal requests for legal consults. And so those are just the, is this even legal questions? It's important to note always that just because something is the way that things have always been done doesn't mean that it's the legal way. So it's important to get the facts straight. It's important to always go to the source of the information. And so I served on a board as well for a nonprofit. And I remember there always, you know, being things about, well, we've always done this this way. And I'm sure this is the right way to do it. But it's, it's always important to get the facts straight. So for example, we had an organization, uh, a domestic and sexual violence organization that wanted to be able to receive money from their county. A county official informed them that it was illegal for the county to give the agency money. So they asked us whether it was true that the county can't provide funds to a domestic and sexual violence agency. And so after doing some legal research, we were able to confirm that a county can give an agency money and that there's a three-part test to determine permissible uses of public funds. If anyone is curious, the test is one, whether the money is given to accomplish a public person, or excuse me, a public purpose. Two, uh, if the government agency, whether it retains control over the funds. So for example, if the government agency requests and accounting every year for the organization to show how the money is being used or put specific restrictions on how the money can be used. And then the third is that the residents of the county must benefit from the transaction. So again, there we have a situation where a non-lawyer is basically deciding what they think is legal or not legal. So it's always important to double check. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, fundraising. And again, fundraising is one of those things that we have entire hours long presentations on. Um, but just to give you some ideas, just of some kind of little interesting tidbits. Uh, so one of the ones is uh, bingo games. Yeah, so you in order to hold a bingo game, you have to, your nonprofit has to have been in existence for at least three years, and you must have a license to hold a bingo game. And the licenses are only good for a certain amount of time. I believe it's four hours, and organizations are limited to a certain amount of licenses. And so there are also limits on how much can be awarded in cash prizes at a single bingo event. So Texas takes bingo very seriously. And so if that's something that your organization is interested in, it's important to make sure you're following the regulations for a bingo event. So raffles also have similar regulations. Nonprofits, again, have to have been in existence for three years to have a raffle. And you can only have two per year, and you can't have them both simultaneously. Raffle tickets can't be generic or pre-printed. They must include certain information about um, when they're going to be drawn, the organization that's drawing them, all sorts of things like that. You also can't advertise through general media. There, um, there's no value limit on prizes that are donated to an organization, but if a nonprofit purchases the prize, they must pay $50,000, less than $50,000, unless it's a residence, they can pay up to $250,000. Um, also, money cannot be a raffle prize. But the one that stood out to me, and I just learned this maybe six months ago, little known fact that with certain restrictions, you can actually raffle off a gun. Welcome to Texas. <laughs> so third party fundraising. So third party fundraising should always raise some red flags. While third-party fundraising can be profitable, there's also a host of legal issues involved. And so when I'm talking about third-party fundraising, I'm talking about another organization or business saying, we want to hold a fundraiser for your organization, and we'll do all the work, and we'll just give you the money. So for example, if an organization has a fundraiser your, that's benefiting your agency, you could potentially be subject to liability if somebody is injured at the event. 
So it's important to make sure that the organizations that you partner with are doing things legally. You need to make sure that the deductions uh, for donations, et cetera, are being done correctly and that it's being advertised accurately regarding how much of the proceeds will go to your organization. It's always a good idea to get what's called a third party fundraising agreement. And so that agreement would be a document between both the organization that's running the event and your organization. And it would cover things like, let's say restrictions on the activities that will occur. So making sure that whatever activities make sense with your mission and are appropriate. Um, a time frame for accounting, so when they're going to turn the donations over to your organization, um, a responsibility for insurance, authority to send acknowledgments to donors, use of the nonprofit's name and logos, uh, pre-approval of promotional materials and advertising, things like that. And then the last thing that I want to talk about here is unrelated business tax. So if your organization makes over $1,000 on something unrelated to its mission, it could have to pay a separate tax on that thing. Um, and you can also lose your tax exempt status if it's something substantial. So for example, if a domestic violence organization is situated on a large plot of land and starts selling timber cut from the organization's land, it could potentially be subject to this tax. So again, there's so much, so, so much on fundraising. And just generally, if you have these, is this legal questions, please send them our way. We're happy to, to help. Other, so again, Trala can help with any kind of non-litigation transactional topics. And when in doubt, it doesn't hurt to ask an attorney. So I want to do a little exercise. So I'm gonna give you all a scenario and I'd like for you to type in the chat box examples of the types of things that attorneys could assist with uh, prior to the issue or to rectify the issue after it occurs and then just being mindful of time after we do these I'll have time for some some questions if you want to type them um, I just want to be mindful of you all's time so with that said okay so your agency provides advocates to accompany survivors to forensic exams. Every advocate fills out a form with information about the services provided to the survivor during the accompaniment. The forensic examiner tells the advocate that it's the hospital's policy to keep the record the advocate made in the survivor's medical file. The form has information on it about the survivor's drug use. The survivor says she wants to report the crime so she fills out a release of information for all documents to be released to law enforcement. A few weeks later, the survivor begins getting counseling at your agency. Your agency receives a subpoena for any and all records regarding this survivor for purposes of a criminal case. So type in the chat box the different issues you see here that might be good to talk to an attorney about before this issue arises and issues that might be want to deal that you might want to deal with after the fact. I'll give you a hint. So what about is do you all see a training issue here regarding the advocate? Christina sees a training issue. Anyone else? No takers. All right, so we have somebody says, before the fact, confidentiality and not providing confidential documents and information to anyone outside of the agency. Yes, exactly. So it's important, one, that she is, that this 
advocate is making the survivor, letting her know about her confidential rights, what will happen to these documents. And then, yeah, if the, if the forensic examiner is saying that they have to take those documents, which are documents that are not created by the examiner, that's not correct. And so the advocate needs to be trained to know what to do in a situation like that. Afterwards, likely we'd want to file a motion to quash. A survivor's counseling file is not relevant to a criminal case. Exactly. So um, one thing that I want to, before not providing confidential info, yes, exactly. So we've got a training issue also here as far as the confidentiality, but also one thing to keep in mind is there could potentially be a training issue um, regarding being mindful as to what to document. So the advocate wrote something on there about the survivor's drug use, and that might not be the best thing to do depending on the purpose of the medical accompaniment form that you have your survivors fill out, or excuse me, your advocates fill out. Part two, does anybody see a, a form issue here? Or a document that you might want a, an attorney to review? <clears throat> So you might want to have an attorney review your medical accompaniment form and to make decisions about what kind of things should be included on that form. And especially, so in our county, we, had, we ran into an issue where the DA was trying to request um, the medical accompaniment form. And so knowing that that's a possibility that made us think about what should actually be on that form. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, then also, as far as a form issue, uh, we talked about, I talked about a release of information. So it's always important to make sure that your releases of information are specific, are time limited. So in this case, if she just signed a document that says all documents in the possession of your agency, and then afterwards, maybe she intended that to only apply to her forensic records. If she goes and gets counseling, there's, there's a chance that that could apply to her counseling records. So it's important to make sure that survivors when they're filling out releases of information. Um, both it's a training issue to make sure that the staff member that is going over the information with them is able to articulate why you want a release to be specific and making sure that it's time limited and then also making sure that the form is, um, is correct and has all of the important information on it. Um, does anybody see a potential policy issue here? For the agency? No comments? Okay, so uh, as far as a policy issue, so one, of course we want to make sure that this organization has a subpoena protocol and is following that and that staff is educated about their subpoena protocol. And then the other policy issue is um, you want to make sure that the advocate is aware of the policies as far as maintaining that accompaniment record. And then there might also be a, an MOU issue, like a memorandum of understanding or a contract issue with the hospital. Can anybody think of what that is? Yeah, happy to repeat the question. So the question is, does anybody see a potential contract issue with the hospital or, or potentially like a memorandum of understanding issue, something that the agency should address with the hospital itself? So the contractual, yes, exactly. The hospital's policy on taking the advocate's form. 
Yes. So we also have another comment saying, absolutely, there should be an MOU with the hospital outlining each person's roles, documentation, chain of custody, confidentiality, et cetera. Exactly. So sometimes there, there should always be an MOU or a contract of some kind. And again, sometimes there might be a training issue with the particular, um, the particular forensic examiner. So um, if this if this advocate is particularly savvy, it might be a good idea to write down the name of the examiner so that they can go back to their agency and make sure have the agency touch base with the hospital uh, to say, hey, we have this MOU. It sounds like there's some confusion about what needs to happen. So following back up. And also, even when you have a contract or an MOU, it's just important to make sure that both sides are aware of it, that it's current, and that there's current training on what should be happening. So that would be a good thing um, to follow up on. So I have, we have about four minutes. I have one more scenario. This one's a little bit, there are fewer issues in this one, so we'll try to squeeze it in. So a person calls your anonymous hotline, and the hotline advocate thinks that the person sounds really young. The caller does not disclose their age. The caller discloses that he was assaulted by a parent and that his parents can't know he's calling. He wants information about forensic exams and about counseling. He does not give any of his identifying information. The next day, the caller comes to your agency asking for counseling. He fills out an intake form and reveals he's 16. The front desk person looks at his sheet and tells him he has to have a parent to consent to his counseling. The caller blurts out that he can't have a parent consent because his parents are abusive. The front desk person says they'll have to call CPS and the caller panics and runs out the door. What issues do you see in this particular scenario that an attorney could have potentially helped with beforehand and afterwards? Yes, so we have agency policies and procedures for providing services to minors. That's a huge one. So um, yeah, so there's, an, there's a policy issue there. And then along with that, there could potentially be a form issue. Let's see, he can consult to his own counseling in certain situations. Exactly. So um, cons yes, consent. Yes, this person can consent to his own counseling in certain situations. So there's a training issue here as well. Um, so the policy issue, of course, is the treatment of minors. There's a training issue also that it's really important, especially when you're dealing with minors, that they immediately know about the potential of CPS reporting so they can decide what and when to disclose. There's a policy issue regarding the anonymity of the hotline. And then um, there's also a form issue here because it's a good idea to have a consent for treatment of a minor form. So there are state laws governing treatment of minors. So for example, if a minor is active duty in the armed forces, they can consent to their own treatment. If they're 16 and living apart from their parents, conservator or guardian, and they manage their own financial affairs, they can consent for themselves. Or if they reveal that they're thinking about suicide, if they have concerns about alcohol or drug addiction, or if they've been physically, emotionally, or sexually abused. So especially if your organization serves minors, it's really important to have good, strong policies that are in compliance with Texas law. So we are right at 12.59. If anybody has questions, they are very welcome to put them in the chat box. Otherwise, again, this is my contact information. I'm happy to hear feedback if you have thoughts about this presentation or if you have questions. Or if there are just legal issues or something that has that your organization has faced or that you're kind of hearing um, among other similar organizations a common legal issue that might uh, be served by some sort of memo or document that might be helpful um, to provide guidance, that's something that we're able to do as well. So please, please, please don't hesitate um, reaching out to me. And happy to answer questions. So we actually have a question about um, fundraisers, bingos, raffles, that, that Trala has lots of training info. How can we access those? 
please email me and I will send you information about fundraisers. We have a handy dandy uh, PowerPoint that I'm pretty sure I could share with you about that. Yes, thank you, well, Jessica. Thank you guys all for your intention. Yeah, this is a great resource. I hope everybody on the webinar um, will definitely be in touch with Jessica. I know you even mentioned resources that I thought I knew that CBAR did, and, and now I, I even have more understanding. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Such a valuable resource. Um, for everybody on the webinar today, we'll we'll post it as well, the recording on our YouTube channel. So if you, there's something that was mentioned today that you want to reference back to, um, you'll be able to find find that on our YouTube channel as soon as we um, get it up there. So thank you, everyone. Um, please take a moment to fill out the evaluation. When the webinar closes, you'll get an automatic generated pop-up. And if you, if you don't do it in the moment, you will also get a link to an evaluation in a follow-up email um, from your registration. Um, so please take a moment. Your feedback is helpful for not only our presenter, but also for future planning of webinars. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Bye.